I think if Harold Town were here, he would probably smash the projector because he hated reproductions. <laughs> now, um, the magic wand. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. I suspect that those of you who already know something about Harold Town will be surprised that I would start my talk on him with this image. And I promise you there are more surprises coming. But first I want to express my thanks to Art Canada Institute who are launching this book and who realized without my prompting that this would be the best possible cover image for the book. I want to thank them for giving me this chance to reveal what I believe is a largely unknown Harold Town. Um, I, I've lectured on Canadian art um, at the University of Guelph and other institutions for about 20 years. And um, I want to say that, that this series of Art Canada Institute books is beyond the wildest dreams I would have had as a professor of Canadian art history for a resource on Canadian art. So I want to thank the inimitable Sarah Angel, who is the begetter of this wonderful project. And um, thanks also to the wonderful editors at Art Canada Institute, Rick Archbold and Meg Taylor, who were a great education to work with. Thanks to Dominique Denis, who has made me sound so sophisticated in French, and picture researcher Gabby Abrams for their wonderful work, and the, the web technicians too. And I also want to thank those people who have given time and assistance during the course of my research. I've pestered quite a lot of people, and I'm still on my way to pester others who have memories of town and who have insights into his work. Um, here this evening, I'm so pleased that Shelley Town was able to come. Um, I don't know if John Reeves is here. Um, <coughs> David Silcox, unfortunately, is out of the country. But many thanks to those associates of town who have spoken with me and to the curators, gallerists, librarians, <coughs> and also to my long-suffering friends. Now, because this is a work in progress, <coughs> I want to thank you, the audience, in advance because I know how much interesting material still has to surface about town, and I'm expecting some really useful feedback from this book publication, which can only graze the surface of town's work. So I want to start today by conjuring up a figure once huge on the Toronto scene. As, as Sarah has said, um, his biography is a fascinating subject. Um, I will not be talking about that very much because I really want to focus on his work. But he is an artist who many people in this room have known personally. He died in 1990. And he was a very glamorous figure, handsome, intense, exuberant, an actor. Around 1950, he had been briefly working with a youthful team who were creating TV plays. He was a man about town and for a time the darling of fashionable society hostesses, a favorite of the press for whom his doings provided colorful copy, and um, the, the Canadian artist who broke all previous sales records, something that um, fascinated the voyeurs of money in this country, a member of Toronto's top cultural echelons, counting among his friends architect John Parkin, Pierre Burton, publisher Jack McClelland, and many other luminaries. He came from a modest background. Born in 1924, he was the son of a CNR railway conductor. His parents were immigrants from England. So he earned his success through his talents and his hard work. Um, and uh, I would say, in a Canada offering public education, growth, and opportunity for all in the post-war period. And of course, he, as Sarah has said, he was also a notorious bad boy, a prankster, argumentative, arrogant, and a master of invective. The anecdotes about him are amusing and numerous, and you will have to read Iris Knowles' books 
and the recorded memories of colleagues such as Robert Fulford and David Silcox. He is present in the room today as our host. The drinks we've been consuming were on Harold, so to speak. And he's also literally present in this room through a group of six wonderful paintings from the late 1950s, which are hanging on the walls and which you may have a chance to go and look at afterwards. Now, most people are already aware of him as part of an important chapter in Canadian art history, that is, as a member of the Painters 11, through whose efforts international abstract expressionist painting burst upon a staid and conservative Toronto. Unfortunately, it is very difficult today to see a full extent of his, his work and get a sense of his achievements. His work is seldom seen in museums. <coughs> It wasn't collected by museums very much after 1970. And if they do have it, they usually show it in the familiar context of Painters 11. So today, my goal is to take you on a journey of discovery to an artist waiting both to be rediscovered and discovered, a prophetic artist ahead of his time, an artist for our time. So this opening image brings us Harold Town, the cultural commentator. It's one of a series of large paintings that he did in 18, so, sorry, 1979 to 80, and I'll dissect it further later in my talk. But the title itself shows us Town as a self-declared intellectual with an ironic sense of humor. Town was also a dedicated Torontonian. If you think that this is not a Toronto image, I want to recall you Northrop Fry, <coughs> a great admirer of Spengler, who actually did a CBC broadcast on him. He felt so strongly that he should be known. Town made a fateful decision to remain throughout his career in Toronto and not to go and study and work abroad in one of the more prestigious art centers, as did most of the members of his generation. It was Paris for Riopelle and Bordua, New York for William Ronald, Michael Snow, and Joyce Wieland. And so this image makes me think of a passage by Franz Kafka, who wrote, you do not need to leave your room. Stay sitting at your table and listen. Simply wait, still and solitary. The world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. This is a recipe for Harold Town. As it turned out, this decision of Town's led to a dramatic reversal in his career. Um, as we'll see, he went from being Toronto's most brilliant and celebrated artist to a figure sidelined as a willful eccentric. But by a twist of fortune, the decision to remain faithful to his hometown brings him in line with today's world where we can sit at our desks and have information circulate to us through the ever proliferating media channels. And in line with today's world where attention has shifted from focus on a prescribed mainstream to, to interest and appreciation of visions from the margins. As we shall see, these were not the only ways in which town predicts our contemporary state of things. So I myself became interested in town's later career th through my 20 years of teaching Canadian art history. Um, my main interest, as Sarah mentioned, was Emily Carr, and I taught courses at Guelph on feminism and art. So it did seem like an odd turn when I became increasingly convinced that here was a major Canadian artist who had not been adequately acknowledged or studied. He had that in common with the women. <laughs> I never met Town in person, but I had always been intrigued by the tyranny of the corner paintings. These were Town's exit strategy from abstract expressionism. The tyrannies are just one of Town's many later exploratory series that I now felt asked to be redefined and to be decoded. I've already had to compress Town into a 15,000 word monograph. 
And now I have the excruciating work of taking you through his career in 30 minutes. <coughs> Impossible. But you know, Brian Boygon, a prominent figure in town, Toronto's postmodern upsurge of the 1980s, pointed out that Town had already compressed himself. He described Town's late stages paintings, like the one that he's reviewing here in Canadian Art Magazine, as an all-out instant replay on compact disc that freeze frames the visual meta-language of his entire repertoire. <laughs> so, I'm so sad that Brian Boygon left Toronto for California, and so he's not with us tonight. We do have to start with a brief look at Painters 11, where Town's story of success begins. And I'm glad to say that today we're in the midst of a revival of interest in Painters 11. There are new books coming out, exhibitions, there's a big retrospective of Jock McDonald at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and um, regular exhibitions of Painters 11 at Christopher Cutts Gallery. So that people will have lots more access to this exciting period in Toronto art history. The group came together late in 1953 to create exhibitions that would make a show of strength for the newly emerging abstraction in Toronto. Um, on this image, you see nine of the 11. Um, I don't know if you want me to point them out, but from left to right, there's Alexandra Luke, then um, Harold Town next to her standing, uh, Jock McDonald, um, Walter Yarwood, and then standing from the back, Ray Mead, Jack Bush, Hortense Gordon, um, Nakamura, and Tom Hodgson. So there are two absences here, um, which I'll talk about. But I just wanted to say the older members here, you can see there's a great spread of ages. The older members contributed their experience and mentorship. Um, while the young and aggressive members, particularly Harold Town and William Ronald, were gung-ho to conquer the world. Um, and the younger artists were all still working and earning their living in commercial art at the time. Town was a real live wire in the group, uh, coining the title Painters 11, writing their artist statements, um, writing an essay for the memorial show that he and Bush organized for Oscar Cahen, one of the founding members, who tragically was killed in a car crash in 1956. So in this painting, you see Cahen represented by two of his paintings. And the paintings that are turned to the wall are canvases by William Ronald, who had just resigned in 1957 from Painters <laughs> 11, <laughs> because he had a permanent contract with one of the most prestigious galleries in New York, the Samuel Coutts Gallery, and decided that New York was now his place. So um, I do want to mention that Cahen was extremely important to town and to all the Painters 11 because he brought with him from Europe the kind of confidence in the role of art within society and culture and the kind of acquaintance with the modern art movements that was there in New York through the presence of European refugee artists who had come there during the war. And artists like Max Ernst, uh, Juan Miro, Piet Mondrian. And um, I think it hasn't been realized how important that aspect of Cahen's presence was, as well as his own wonderful painting. So, Painters 11 set out to revolutionize the Toronto cultural scene. We have to remember that this was an extremely exciting period in Toronto. Nin the 1950s were the period of post-war recovery of economies, um, restoration of travel and communications. It was the eve of an era of unprecedented affluence. The city of Toronto grew beyond its boundaries at Eglinton <laughs> Avenue. And the TTC was being constructed. I mean, you know, nowadays it seems so difficult to, to expand without terrible ructions. But that, that was the brave time of, of putting in the Toronto we have today. The City Hall was being built in a modern style and so on. So this was the Toronto in which Painters 11 signaled a new young art scene that brought Toronto to international, to Toronto, international currents of art. And 
this whole artistic development too was backed by the economic growth of the city, which generated new art patrons and it, they in turn supported new dealer galleries, a new gallery scene, which by 1957 was remarked upon um, as a, a, an amazing new social development in Toronto. So um, the stylistic inspiration of these artists was actually very international through art magazines and books which they um, greedily acquired. Harold Town, Harold Town's library was um, offered to the AGO to cull and they took at least 70 books from his library, books that they didn't have for their own library. Um, I, I'm not sure what happened to the rest, I'd like to know. but. Um, also, uh, well, th there wasn't so much opportunity to see international art um, in Toronto until, uh, there was none at all, until 1949, after the end of the war, when there was a big exhibition of British, French, and American contemporary painting. 